the large amount of work we do on new platform is functionality parity. So PyTorch is a fairly big API surface. It's about a thousand API functions, and then it composes with whether you have a quantized tensor or a regular tensor and various other things distributed. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about machine learning in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Today, we're talking with Sumit Chantala, a VP at Meta AI Research and one of the original authors of PyTorch, which is currently by far the most popular deep learning framework. We talk about the internals of PyTorch, managing a large open source community, and his opinions on the other popular ML libraries. I hope you enjoy this one. All right. Well, maybe we could start by hearing what PyTorch is for the, the, the 001% of the audience that might not know. Thanks for having me, Lucas. Um, PyTorch is a accelerated scientific computing library. People largely use it to write neural networks, and it gets a lot of attention these days because neural networks have become pretty important and are used from chat GPT to cancer research. So PyTorch helps with all of that. And I guess, you know, PyTorch came from Torch, right? Could you tell a little bit about the, the story of that? I got involved in the Torch open source community starting 2011, 2012. Torch was a scientific computing library that had acceleration. It was based on Lua, which was, which is a language you often use to write video games and microwave software. But then Torch, like Torch, uh, Lua was pretty well suited for it and uh, the previous uh, the founders of Torch, Ronan Colobert, Kobe Kabukioglu, Klima Farabe, they wrote it in 2009, 2000, uh, actually somewhere between 2005 and 2009, because there are two versions of it written in Lua. And that was a great package. It was a scientific computing package that had neural network support. And some of the best uh, research labs at that time, from DeepMind to FAIR to Twitter to um, a bunch of universities, were using Torch uh, to do their research. Eventually, as things go, the scientific field moved. And as they moved, they needed new tools, and the old tools got outdated. And so we wanted to write a new a uh, tool that was more in line with what people were doing in 2016, 2015. So we decided to rebuild a new version of Torch. And one of the things that people have moved had moved on by then to was Python as their primary la language for scientific computing. It wasn't evident or obvious in 2007 or 8, uh, but it was pretty obvious in 2016. And so we rewrote a new version of Torch, completely new design, and in Python, that ended up being PyTorch. And now I remember back then, I mean, that was around the time I was starting Weights and Biases. At that point, it seemed like TensorFlow was kind of the runaway dominant library in the field. What did you feel TensorFlow was missing or what inspired you to start kind of a, a rival system? Yeah, so just to recollect 2015, December 2015 was when TensorFlow came out. There were about 15 to 20 deep learning frameworks at that time. It was not a duopoly like it is right now or a tripoly. It was very much that it was a chaos of competition. TensorFlow came out with full, full marketing power, right? So Google was the best research lab at that time. And they top down, put a lot of Google marketing power, put in um, the Google Cloud budget. You know, they, they kind of came in with a force that deep learning frameworks did not even know could be done at that time. Uh, just to give you context, at that time, every deep learning framework that came out had a shell script to compile and install it. It was not, it was not polished engineering. Unit tests were maybe running on ETR. So TensorFlow came in with a lot of positives, one of them being they showed 
the deep learning framework world what high quality engineering was. What they were missing was the incentive structure to care about open source. And part like what comes out of that is engaging with the open source community with no other terms than to help them whether they're asking a stupid question or they're asking for a feature or whether they're sending in pull requests that might not be perfect, but you know, A for effort kind of funds, engaging with the community and understanding them and intimately helping them and building a community out of it. I think that's somewhat what was missing with TensorFlow. And it worked out for us because we had that DNA from the torch days and we just continued it, but with greater magnitude. Interesting. So you don't think it was a big technical difference? Like some people point to the, you know, uh, just in time evaluation of PyTorch as the big reason for its success, but it sounds like you think of it more as community building and engagement. I strongly believe TensorFlow stood for a programming model that had a reasonably good chance of success. One of the clearest examples you can take as to why technical direction was not really the reason for TensorFlow to not stand up to expectations is JAX. JAX actually is very similar to TensorFlow in its programming model. You have to trace a program ahead of time and then run it later in the XLA runtime. But people find JAX's experience to be totally fine. And I think TensorFlow is going away from its symbolic execution model uh, from the TensorFlow 1.0 to the TensorFlow 2.0 transition was probably the biggest positive for PyTorch in that if people had to transition from a symbolic execution model to an eager execution model, why would they switch to an eager framework that is zero days old when there is a framework called PyTorch that has been doing this for a couple of years by then? I guess what when you say a duopoly or triopoly of um, deep learning frameworks, I, I guess I, I sort of view PyTorch as the runaway success. Like, who do you kind of in, include if you if you say a second or a third? I think uh, depends on which bubble you are. You kind of believe whether PyTorch or TensorFlow is bigger. I think that's largely slowly, like I think PyTorch is becoming bigger in almost all circles, but TensorFlow does still hold a lot of weight in some circles, some segments. I think if you still see Kaggle competitions of certain kinds, there's still TensorFlow usage and stuff. So I was mainly referring to PyTorch, TensorFlow, and JAX. And I guess, what are the considerations between a, as you called it, symbolic execution model and an eager execution model? Like, how did, how did you come to your point of view and, and what are the trade-offs? A symbolic execution model is it's not something that's new. In fact, with TensorFlow and PyTorch, I see this as a very natural evolution of Tiano and Torch, which were previous generation frameworks at that time. Tiano and TensorFlow are very similar, um, and PyTorch and Torch are very similar in that there's symbolic versus eager execution model. Generally, the people who like and cared about symbolic execution models believe in the power of compilation and its ability to extract a lot more performance out of the system. And the people who believe in eager execu execution models believe that the compiler people always say this but never deliver performance. So when we built PyTorch in 2016 and when we used Torch before as the community of Torch users, we we believed more in the need to run the program with semantics that are very simple to understand. It's like I run it, it runs. I don't really have to think about it too much. I don't need five abstraction layers. And this, this, uh, this philosophical difference, by the way, is not just in the deep learning world. The graphics world went through the same 
thing in the 90s or in the 80s to 90s where they had immediate execution modes and graphics and 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 i think they would call it pipeline execution and immediate execution won out again because of simplicity so this is like this deep philosophical thing that i think comes from innate biases in people and they just prefer one or the other interesting because i think it really matters what you're doing right like i you know certainly compilers exist and are are useful in lots of domains right so um i mean what do you think it is about deep learning that i guess um prefers a um a more uh just in time execution model yeah so i think you always have to evaluate whether a particular thing is useful in a given time based on its circumstances the compiled execution model in 2015 did not buy you very much for two reasons. One, it the compilers of that time, the ML compilers of that time, weren't very ready or sophisticated. People had to do some more research and engineering to get those compilers to do useful things. The second reason is the the accelerators primarily at the time were NVIDIA GPUs, and they were already being saturated by eager execution mode. So it's not the case as of today. As of today, the compilers have gotten sophisticated and mature enough that they are able to extract a lot more performance out of a compiled model. And the accelerators have gotten so fast and so large that unless you compile your model, you're not able to saturate the GPUs because the neural networks have stayed relatively of similar sizes in, in relativeness to how fast the GPUs are getting. Um, mostly, you, you, the, the primary thing is on GPUs, the compute, the number of compute uh, flops you have has increased a lot faster than the amount of memory bandwidth you have. So it was okay to be uh, using eager mode when your compute to bandwidth ratio was a lot more reasonable. But now you're forced to compile or else you're just going to be memory bandwidth bound. You need to do a lot more while you're computing things in register or else you're just going to be bottlenecked by how fast you move your tensors from register to main memory and back. So then are you predicting that more people will move to a compiled model over time? Yeah, we predict that. And that is primarily why we invested in and released PyTorch 2.0 late last year, where we introduced a compiled mode. We do expect that people generally will, f there's two phases, right? People generally in, in, in AI and in, in deep learning, they experiment and there's a lot of iterative debugging. You change things, you experiment, you try things, whatever. And I believe that phase will still somewhat be dominated uh, by eager mode. And then you then run your large scale experiment for two days to two weeks to two months, like, you know, depending on what you're doing. And these large scale switchovers, like, okay, I'm going to be running this for X number of days. They're all going to be using compiled mode because you, you get, you get, 2x to 4 or 5x performance uh, in addition. So why would you leave that up? I guess when I think about myself, kind of going back four or five years, you know, I'm certainly not as sophisticated as you or, you know, probably, you know, your your super users or many of our listeners. But I, I do remember using PyTorch and using TensorFlow. And frankly, I wasn't making any use of, you know, modifying the model in flight. But I did find PyTorch easier to use, like maybe just for the fact that I could inject print statements and have them, you know, print out. I guess, wh why do you think someone like me gravitated towards PyTorch when I'm kind of not making use of any of the really additional functionality that's offered by um, an eager mode? And, and and why did why did so many, many people make the transition if, if compiled mode is, is faster and hands a lot of the, handles a lot of the normal cases reasonably well? 
PyTorch versus TensorFlow or Eager versus Compiled are slightly different. TensorFlow 1 was symbolic programming. You could actually write an Eager mode symbolic programming too. So uh, what made it harder for you to use TensorFlow versus using PyTorch is whether you were symbolically programming, which is effectively like metaprogramming. You have to think not in terms of the idea that you have, but in terms of how you need to fit that idea into this other complicated symbolic system. I think it's similar for you to mentally think about, you have an idea and you know how to do it. Let's just say you know how to physically do it. But if I ask you, oh, can you write exactly what you're thinking as a mathematical equation? Then you'll have to really like think that through because even though you have the idea, it's in your head, you just need to translate it into math, but the math, the, the mathematical s symbolism is a meta is 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 a system of its own, and you need to be like, oh, it has a summation, it has a that, it has a this, and I need to express what I'm thinking in terms of mathematical terms. So a lot of people um, find it hard to, for example do math as fast as someone who's practiced math really well and like, you know, done homework and writing proofs and stuff. It's very similar. So PyTorch just gave you Python. It's just like, I am very stupid. You have an idea and you know Python, you just write your program. And I'm not trying to do anything more. I'm just a small library in Python. And TensorFlow was a symbolic programming system. You, so you had to spend this additional training. Uh, to, you had to train yourself to use TensorFlow. So that's primarily the challenge people faced. And one of the things that Jax tries to get better at, right, is it's like you don't need to program symbolically. Just write your NumPy program and then trace it. And we will try to recover the symbolic programming. And similarly, PyTorch with torch.compile, that's exactly the promise we say. We say, oh, you have a PyTorch program. Don't even think about what it means to compile. Just wrap your program with a torch.compile call, and we will try to figure out what to compile and what not to compile. It's not your problem to figure out. So that cognitive overhead was what got people with TensorFlow 1's symbolic programming. I guess what took you so long to build a compiled mode like what, what's like tricky about that when when you're kind of already doing it to some extent just to to run these things like what 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 made it need a, a whole new version to, to get that yeah um our compiled our compiler this is the fifth compiler we built we at we we spent a lot of time trying to get it right the biggest challenge is exactly the promise i just made to you earlier which is you just wrap a torch.compile call and it's our problem to figure out what to do about it. Like, it's not your problem. We do not want to put a cognitive overhead on you on whether you like whether you need to start thinking about, oh, is this program compilable? Do I need to adjust a line? Did I get an error message and I don't understand it? So we had to experiment and research a lot with ways in which we can recover parts of the Python program in a way that is pretty seamless and fall back to Python when we simply cannot recover the program and compile it. And then on top of it, we had to make the program faster. If not, users would use the compiled mode, but not really find any benefit out of it, which again is not very useful. Both of these things, especially the first one. The second one, people have figured out how to make the programs faster once you acquire them, like since like 2016 through like 2020. But acquiring the program correctly and well, that was something that was the biggest challenge. And I would say it was a breakthrough that we made. Um, our system that, that we I consider is a breakthrough, it's called Torch Dynamo, and we built it um, we first built it in December 2021, and then we refined it over the last year before releasing it in December last year. And now you actually need to calculate the gradient for arbitrary code to do the, the gradient descent, right? Like, I, I feel like, is that even, I feel like there must be some mathematical theorem that says you can't calculate the gradient of arbitrary code that I generate, right? Like, couldn't I create some pathological thing where it's impossible to find the, the gradient if you let me do anything I want to? Yeah, you 
you can not calculate the gradient of a bunch of discontinuous programming constructs. For example, when you take the max of something, we only actually calculate gradient through the things that were passing through and it's zero gradient everywhere else. And that's okay. That's still like the gradient is correct, but not what you would traditionally consider continuous gradient, right? It's not a smooth function. Um, so at the edges, it's actually not, there's no gradient that exists. Generally, it works out because largely people try to do in a program language is differentiable, mathematically at least. Like if, you do, if you're doing it on tensors, then it's it largely works out. How do the, the, the chips fit into this? Like everybody talks about sort of CUDANN being this really impressive, um, you know, library and, and, you know, AMD always seems like they're trying to, you know, make something for, for people. Do like, how, how much are you coordinating with the hardware providers to make PyTorch useful? A lot. So we, we see ourselves as we have two sets of customers. One set of customers who are users of PyTorch from the front end side, they express their mathematical ideas in PyTorch to get their job done. And we have the back end customers, customers of hardware, hard, basically hardware vendors of various kinds on the server side, on the edge side. And they are trying to get their hardware to work well within the PyTorch abstraction. Because if they do, then they get all these, they get these millions of customers automatically. So a large part of the work we do on existing platforms, such as NVIDIA GPUs and CPUs, is performance tuning. Hey, like the sweet spot has changed on this new GPU. So we have to update our internal code and passes to, to make it more performant. The large amount of work we do on new platforms, such as AMD or Mac GPUs or you know other kinds of accelerators, such as TPUs, is functionality parity. So PyTorch is a fairly big API surface. It's about a thousand API functions. And then it composes with whether you have a quantized tensor or a regular tensor and various other things distributed. To make a backend work smoothly for PyTorch takes a lot of work. And so that zero to one is something that we work on with a lot of newer vendors such as TPUs and AMD GPUs and Apple. Okay, another question I had is how you measure success while developing PyTorch or what metrics you look at. You know, we found some quotes of you saying that you've never responded to irrelevant measures like, you know, GitHub stars or um, speed benchmarks. But I was wondering if you try to hold yourself accountable with hard usage metrics or if the process of building thing is really intuitive. We think of metrics as one way to help success. I think there's a lot of products and a lot of people while they're building products, they try to develop metrics much earlier than they should because they think optimizing for the metric is going to, or even measuring just the metric is, is, is gives them a very objective and safe path to success. A lot of that works out when you're building a performance product or something that clearly is measurable. But if you think about PyTorch, our entire thesis was, hey, we're going to give you a better user experience. And as far as I know, there isn't an, a good, effective, well-understood measure of user experience. It's a very subjective thing. So for the first two to three years of our development, we used some signal, like number of downloads and number of research papers citing PyTorch, but a large amount of our product iteration came from listening to users. I would personally read 500 notifications a day from forums to Twitter and reply to a lot of them. We would constantly engage with a lot of our customer base very directly. And we did a lot of these exercises. We have a great team of uh, six people who constantly engage with our top heavy customers or customers who 
disproportionately bring a lot of value to the PyTorch ecosystem. And this entire process really helps us make sure we are iterating on our product and we're improving our product in the right way. To me, the, the metrics we use are more of a tailwind of sanity check. Like, okay, we are actually still on the right track. Things are improving, but we don't really use them to inform our development cycle or even like incentivize our success. So when you think about a roadmap, how do you incorporate all the customer feedback? Like, who would I be that where you would listen to my feedback, you know, more loudly? Or, or what would I be doing where you would feel free to discount my, my feedback? We basically aggregate feedback from a variety of sources, right? We, we, we aggregate them from forums, from Twitter, from top heavy engagements that we directly do from our Slack. During planning time, we do this once every six months or so. We basically stack rank it. We aggregate all the feedback and we subjectively weight it by who cared about it. And then we stack rank it. And then the other thing we do that, that might be interesting is then we ask people what they want to pick. Like we have a bunch of engineers who all work on the PyTorch team and we say, well, what do you want to pick? And there's the matching works out reasonably well, but there are some features that didn't make it to the top of the stack, but they ended up being worked on because someone thought it was cool. And then there's features who didn't make it to the top of the stack that didn't get worked on because no one wanted to work on it. So there's some amount of, is this a cool novel thing that also helped naturally like helps us gravitate to things. That's roughly how it goes. Those are mostly the large amount of volume features we do. And then there's the the deeper strategy, which is like, hey, we need to do a torch.compile now. And you know, think things that meaningfully are gonna change our product. They, they, they usually almost never come from user feedback. Like zero number of times do they come from user feedback. We we have a natural hierarchical maintainer structure and there's some core maintainers and we discuss strategy and we figure out what to do and when based on changing industry trends. How do you think about libraries built on top of you like fast AI or lightning? Like, do you try to collaborate with them and, and not build overlapping functionality? Are they important constituents? Yeah, so our, our entire principle here is we should be doing the least amount of work we can get away with. So we strongly believe that we want to let the community be empowered by us uh, and we want to be doing less of, we want to eat our community's lunch because we feel hungry. So we are not even that big of a team in relativeness to the size of the community. So it'd be foolish of us to take any other strategy unless like incentives are, like incentives are completely misaligned. We generally, when we think about taking a direction, we first make sure no one else in the community is interested in taking that direction. And if there are people interested in taking that direction in the community, we first make sure they either succeed or fail by giving them some time. And we usually, the core PyTorch team takes directions that the community doesn't have the incentive to take or they don't have the interest to take, but a large amount of the community wants that direction to be taken. So when there's an asymmetry, that is generally perfect for us. So we work very closely with Fast AI, Lightning, a bunch of our stakeholders in the community to empower them, to enable them. And it's it, it, it works well for us. Like if they do more, then we need to do less. And we, we have plenty of things to do. We, I think we have tens of thousands of issues open. We can work for a lifetime and still have more work to do. So that's how we see it. How do you work with um, FAIR, or is it still called FAIR? The, meta, so yeah. the Facebook um, research group, right? You're, you're a part of that. What benefit does FAIR get? Like, why do they invest in it? And do you do things other than working on PyTorch there? Yeah, I, I've, been at, I've been at Meta for close to nine years. They hired me for working on Torch um, because they were a big user of Torch at that time. In general, PyTorch clearly brings value to Meta in a variety of ways. One of them, 
uh, there's like six or seven of them I wrote down at some point. But the clearest value I would say is the larger the ecosystem, the faster meta can iterate on their own AI work. Imagine right now, just as an example, not as a dig or anything, but like Google uses TensorFlow in production. Now, if there's a new AI development, especially in research, it largely comes out in PyTorch. So now their applied scientists internally have to then take that code, roughly rewrite it in, in TensorFlow, test it, um, make sure everything checks out, and then start their research and development from that point, right? So just using the same tooling as everyone else in the industry works great. And large companies generally, especially Meta, Google, like a few others, they kind of want to use what they built. So Meta investing in PyTorch and keeping it open source, I think it strictly works out in like multitude of ways here. The other thing I want to say is when you have a large ecosystem, if you're using the most popular tool in the ecosystem, you can decide to do something new a year later and then get a head start because other people in the world have been working on that thing, whatever that is. And then you can start from there and you don't have a lot of lift in terms of tooling and all of that. So the timeline edge is, is, is a big one. And I have to be honest if uh, I say at least one or two people we have hired because we use PyTorch and not TensorFlow. So there's obviously that recruiting thing, but I think it's a very small component of the overall thing. It's mainly the ecosystem that really helps. So I guess from that perspective, then becoming the standard must have been really important to PyTorch. And I'm wondering, like, b besides the obvious thing that you keep talking about of building the highest quality, uh, most useful library. Were there other things you did to try to make PyTorch the, the fastest growing or the, the standard deep learning framework? Generally, strategically, if you try to become the standard, you will not become the standard. If you try to build the best thing you can, your like your chances of becoming the standard will be much higher just because that's the most obvious thing to happen. Unless there are unless there are like two characteristically ideologically different pro projects that are both doing great. And so then you'll have two or three or four. The only thing we strive to do, honestly, is to build the best scientific computing framework. And we're, we hope that it works out in all other aspects, such as becoming the standard. But we not really thought about that aspect top down. I guess what about the, um, the community? I mean, you mentioned sort of engaging with people's pull requests, but it seems like you really did a wonderful job at building a vibrant community. Do you think there are any other like, I, I don't know, little tricks there? I'm sure a lot of people are listening that are part of community or like a try to build a community for themselves, me included. D do you have any advice? I think uh, one advice I would give is to go in with a lot more trust and going in with a lot more ability to empower someone who seems to be doing good work, but you don't necessarily know them. PyTorch, the other thing that people don't really know it directionally gets lost even though we try to remind people is PyTorch was only partly built at meta eventually meta became one of the biggest research like they, they put a lot of resources into PyTorch and uh, became one of the biggest contributors but PyTorch was a carryover from the torch community and the torch community was a bunch of people who just liked torch on the internet the primary paper author on PyTorch, the first author, Adam Pashka, he and I met online because he was writing some blog posts on Torch. I think he wrote one or two blog posts on Torch about its internals. And I was like, oh, this, this is cool. So he messages me uh, one day on one of those online chat things. And he says, hey, I'm looking for an internship. I'm in Poland. I haven't gotten one yet. It's pretty late in the summer. And I said, hey, we've been thinking of building this Python torch thing, right? Um, and we were. At that time, he, me, like a bunch of other people, Natalia Gimelshan from NVIDIA, Luca Antiga, Andreas Kof, all of these people, they're not affiliated with that, like one company. or They're just like, we're, we're doing this as like a band of people online. And so when he said that, I'm like, hey, I, I have an intern slot. Um, why don't you come interview? And if it works out, 
you can you can build that Python torch thing that that we were thinking about. So he did, and he came on board, and he, me, and Sam Gross were full time on this project, and that's how PyTorch emerged. It was like pretty organic. I think the PyTorch had community and community empowerment in its DNA, and that like it it started with it and a lot of people participated in PyTorch development and there were all people who were online and they worked with us they became they've become friends online over the years we might or might not have even met them in person so i think that that kind of trusting and there's a lot of ambiguity in community building you have to obviously trust a bunch of people and you know not everyone's capable in the same way and not everyone turns out to be a rock star you kind of you don't do it with an ulterior end goal you do it to see where the direction goes have, have there been um, any i, think, I have, guess like one thing that i hear about in a lot of open source communities is they can kind of you know get toxic or you can kind of get stuck because you know it's kind of hard to make decisions in this very decentralized way have there been sort of like yeah. tough calls where not everyone agreed that you've you've had to work through uh, absolutely so i think maybe if there's one thing i brought with a lot of value to pytorch is shaping its culture and shaping the incentive structures even within a community building the community you really have to carefully build incentive structures. So there were tough calls. For example, one of the biggest contributors to Torch in its last couple of years, he did not agree with the Python direction at all. And so imagine if you have someone who's pumping out code like it's nobody's and they disagree with the direction, what do you do? Do you kind of compromise on the vision or not? Do you bring them along? A lot of these are very ambiguous calls, very tough calls. There's no right answer. You kind of go with what feels like long-term and directionally, right? But in terms of incentive structures, I think a lot of communities do end up becoming toxic because they don't, they, I don't, I think they're too afraid to kick out the assholes. I think you have to do that proactively. You should first never let, let them come in, but like it's inevitable. But then you should never let them get more of a voice. I think you have to kind of protect your family or your community is your family. Right? You have to like keep it close knit. And if there's people who are being not great, then you should just push them out. Well, what quickly. does it even mean you... to, to push someone out of an open source community? Can you? Tell us the story. You don't yeah, have to name I names, but should... I would love to hear like like how that actually works. I think you should largely let them know. First, like you should a lot of people are afraid to even say something to another person. Like the step one is like establishing what is not okay. So letting people know that something was not okay immediately sets the tone. For example, there's one time in the early development of PyTorch Slack that someone who's a great person in general, they posted a meme onto the random channel, one of the channels that was a little sexist. And I was like, this is not okay. Please do not ever post this again. And that sets the tone. People kind of understand what's okay and what's not okay. I think a lot of communities, like people don't like doing that. People don't like to be that person who tries to enforce things because it is a fine balance and getting it wrong can make it like overly restrictive getting it it's hard the the one thing i just want to drop one incentive that we strongly enforce from day one is you know when you talk to people saying hey how do you how do you build a community how do you expand it one of the quickest things that it says hey why don't we introduce a a reward system. Why don't we give people monetary incentives? Why don't we give them gifts for contributing and stuff? I think open source generally works really well when the motivation is intrinsic. So one guiding principle I've had for a very long time, and you can't do it all the way to the end, but at least till, till the community reaches a critical mass, is don't rely on extrinsic motivation to build your community because it's not going to last very long once you take away the extrinsic motivation. Figure out if people would come there because that's the most interesting thing to do and that's why they're coming. Well, I guess, you know, you've mentioned incentives a whole bunch of times so far and then you've said kind of what incentives not to use, but I guess like what incentives do you kind of intentionally use to motivate the kind of behavior that you want? 
recognizing good quality work and recognizing hard work, these happen less often than you realize. I think people only recognize certain kinds of good quality or hard work and recognizing it consistently and over time, that really matters. Um, a lot of our contributors work at various companies, small and large, with their own incentive structures. I've written recommendation letters for someone's promotion directly to their boss because not even at my company, like at, at another company, because I wanted them to be recognized for what they did. And I explained to leadership at the other company why this thing is so hard and why this person is fantastic. I think various kinds of recognition, I think you got to get right because it helped like, you know, they're doing it because they feel like that's the coolest thing to do, but they also like have a life to live and there's a social aspect to it and there's a extrinsic aspect to it in their own terms that, you know, you try to help. Going in a, in a slightly, well, actually, wait, I have one more one more question on Fighter specifically, and this is something I experienced that I've always wondered about, which is I remember when I was developing against, you know, PyTorch 0 0.3 and 0 0.4, and, and I actually did the first, you know, weights and biases integration with PyTorch myself, so I really felt this. It seemed like you had tons and tons and tons of breaking API changes, which I kind of wonder if in retrospect that was actually a really good plan because it caused you to bravely move forward or if if that was um kind of unintentional or not you know i think you're the first person no, to say maybe that. I'm, maybe I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while so i think it's always relative mm, so people compared us to tensorflow and mxnet um, and they said hey i wrote this code in pytorch point two and it still works still today and stuff like that so we always thought we were good at that the breaking changes and it's culturally within within the project we care about not breaking user land it's we passionately think about how it doesn't matter if it's a user land bug it is our problem once like users do it intuitively then it's our problem to fix and solve so anyways that's the that's the first time i'm hearing All it right. so <laughs> Probably it's because I was building tools against it versus like, you know, using it, the, the internals kind of mattered. Yeah. Heard that you helped Meta acquire papers with code, which I thought was an awesome acquisition. And it was a product that we loved, you know, before and after the acquisition. I'm curious if you could comment on that at all. Yeah, this was uh, several years ago and I thought papers with code was phenomenal. This friend of mine, uh, who was the PyTorch project manager at that time, Joe Spizak and I, we flew to London to convince uh, Robert and Ross, the co-founders of Papers with Code, and we pitched it to our VP at that time, Jerome, and I think I can't give a lot more of the details, but we ended up, it, ended, it all ended up working out really well. If you could rewrite PyTorch from scratch, would you change anything fundamental? If I could rewrite it from scratch, which I think like this is the part where if I rewrote it today, I would do it very differently than if I rewrote it in 2016. Totally. Like if I rewrote it in 2016, I probably would do exactly the same thing because I don't think we got many things wrong from our point of view at that time. If I rewrite it today, I would do a lot more Python and write a lot of our kernels in Triton and do a lot less C++ and do a little bit of like boxing of integers and things like that that will that do help with like symbolic um, not, sorry uh, symbolic integers and stuff so that you don't need to have tensors around everything. I would do a few things today because a lot has changed within the hardware landscape that uh, and and the compiler landscape that allow us to write it way more compactly and way more efficiently than we could have in 2016. Well, one of the things we've seen at Weights and Biases lately, actually through the life of Weights and Biases, but especially lately, is kind of a movement from traditional ML researcher, ML engineer, to more of like a software developer that, that knows enough to be dangerous about ML or, or potentially even less over time. You're kind of a lower level, more technical framework maybe than weights and biases, but I was wondering if you see this also on your side and if you're reacting to it at all. Yeah. 
Yeah, one of our biggest trends we're seeing is a lot of our users are now not even aware that they're using totally. PyTorch. And they know they're using stable diffusion packaged up in a Mac app or Hugging Face um, uh, hub and spaces and like things like that. So we are, it is, um, it would be a lie for me to say we're not thinking about it. Actually, it's, it is the biggest question on my plate that I'm figuring out what to do about. I think it has to do with thinking about this whole thing in terms of leverage. I said we have two sides of customers, right? On one side is hardware vendors and the other side is users. On hardware vendors, it's always been dominated by NVIDIA and we, we try to help out other vendors, but they don't have a significant market share. On the user side, it's always been pretty well balanced. There's no like single dominating uh, user cluster. And we are now seeing that there's a bunch of users a bunch of user clusters and then a new cluster that is just ballooning up to be much larger and they don't even use our API directly. So strategically, I wouldn't say this is existential for us as a product, but this is existential for us from the changing leverage dynamics. So a, a, a front-end application tomorrow can ask us to change our API and we would not have the reverse leverage to say no to them if that doesn't align with our philosophy. Because as I said in a couple of places before, we are very pragmatic. We we serve the users. We have some grounding philosoph philosophical things, but largely they're very low level. And like otherwise we make decisions where they're very pragmatic. So I, I kind of mostly worry about this aspect that you talked about. I don't really have solutions to share. We are actively thinking about And when it. you say, clusters you mean hugging face as stable diffusion users or, or something else yeah i think hugging face is still i think somewhat diversified in that they don't have a vertical application that dominates so people like have apps and these apps are used millions of times and these apps package in like pytorch right so that's only used for one thing Right. And but then that one thing is used more than most other things people use PyTorch for. So I would say that more more like that. So you've you've expressed some excitement about some of the new frameworks like Jax, you said, and TinyGrad and GGML and others. Could you say a little more about that? Like like what are what are some of the innovations that you're seeing in some of these new things that you appreciate? I largely well, not largely. I, I pretty much care about competition, uh, especially friendly competition, where I think it is strictly always helpful, not just to user land, not just to consumers, but to yourself, because it lets us push ourselves. For example, when Jax was being developed, we proactively engage with them try to tell them what things to do and not to do. And when Jax was released, we tried to help put in a good word with a bunch of people saying, this is great. And we tried to like retweet things from our personal account and stuff like that. So Jax, I think, is exploring a philosophical direction that we think is interesting. And I think a lot of good ideas will come out of it. And even if we might not use Jax's ideas in their own form, it will help us inform and take the field. And how forward. would you how would you describe so Jax's philosophical direction? Um, Jax is trying to be a pure func purely functional graph acquisition framework that uses its purely functional nat nature to write elegant functional transforms that let people get the, there's a whole cult of like functional, functional programmers who like, oh, I like to just do map and reduce and, you know, various these functional transforms that powerfully transform their program. And Jax is trying to explore that to the limit. And I think functional deep learning is probably their philosophy. Yeah. So I think like Jax has been pretty great at validating a lot of good ideas, exploring a lot of good ideas, invalidating a lot of good ideas that helped us inform our own direction in various ways. GGML and TinyGrad are slightly different. GGML is taking a full vertical integration approach. They're like, hey, if all we had to do was build a framework for Llama, like 
all it, did, it only has one purpose in life, then how can we take that idea to its extreme and see what comes out of it? So they're they're doing fairly interesting things. There are a lot of a lot of idea idea exploration, like what quantization ends up working out, what what users like, um, what are the baselines for performance on a Mac or something. These all are really useful to know, and these are all quickly validated by TGML, and that helps us inform our own thing. The tiny grad stuff, I think it's philosophically, as Jihad said, we are a complex instruction set. Jihad thinks that a reduced instruction set is sufficient for deep learning where you kind of don't really need control flow. You don't need a bunch of other factors. We don't think so, but he thinks so. And I think someone should go explore it and that would be fantastic and something good will come out of it. One thing, one great thing that could probably come out of it, he's going to build a fantastic AMD backend that maybe we will seed for further development or something like that. So yeah, I kind of like when people take directions that are not the directions we're taking and explore them. Do you have any thoughts on open source model versus closed source model machine learning? I mean, I think that's a topic everyone's been talking about. We see, you know, stable diffusion or stability, I guess, putting out a lot of open models and a lot of models going to hugging face in yet. I think most of what we see our customers using when they're prompt engineering LLMs these days is is GPT-4, or maybe Anthropic, or maybe Cohere. Do you think that's likely to change? Or I'm obviously biased because I built most of my adult life in open source. Even before I had a job or anything, I would just do open source for fun all the time. I find a certain amount of liberation in open source. I find a certain amount of transparency and a certain amount of empowerment in open source. I think I would not have been as empowered as a an individual with a, like a low-powered laptop that I would shared with my dad in India where you didn't really have money to buy expensive software if it wasn't for open source. I mean, open source and piracy, just to say it, right? I mean, it's just true. So, and only one of them is legal. <laughs> so people think open source, so, so there's like, hey, why do you want to open source? This is a standard question, right? Why are you trying to give away your stuff? Why you can you know sell it for more money and things like that, right? I I think that's all well and good. There's money to be made in open source, you know, case in point, just look at me. But I I think if you take the IP aspects, put it on one side, there's obviously the, the AI people who believe large AI models are not safe to deploy and stuff like that. I think this is a very this is a debate where it depends on what you value more. You bias towards that outcome. So if you if you believe it is more important to empower people, even though you'll see a little bit of spam spike up in like the short term in the, you know, like the year of the, these models being open source, but it's way more important for this kid in Nigeria to have access to this model to do whatever they want to do to create value locally. If you believe that trade-off of open sourcing is more important than the slight negative effects that come out. Or if you believe, I strongly believe that if we open source this model, then everyone will die and AI will like kill people or whatever. I think it really believe, it depends on what people believe in. I think there's a lot of, because it is not an obvious outcome that you can estimate probabilities accurately to whatever people believe is accurate they are going to take decisions in that direction i believe the air models of the, like this this current generation and maybe even the next generation will not be any kind of human killing human dangerous kind of the stuff um and I think the open source benefits outweigh not open sourcing. So I, I just think it should be open source. And I also strongly believe in society's ability to adapt. I, I think it's one of those things where I see this repeated pattern of whenever there's a disruptive change, uh, there's a whole class of people who believe that society will collapse and a whole other class of people who believe that society will be fine. And society largely is almost always fine. Um, printing press, uh, industrial revolution. And you, you, you pick and choose what, whatever 
technological revolution, the internet. I, I think uh, people underestimate the ability of society to adapt to things. That's that's roughly where I lean at, and that probably makes me unhirable at like a bunch of places, but whatever. Um, well, taking things in a completely different direction, I heard that you were working on a household robotics project. Would you care to tell us about that at all? Sure, sure. Yeah, I've been, I started working on this stuff. I used to work on robotics like close to 12 years ago for a couple of years. And then I started picking up robotics again, right around 2019, 2020. It primarily comes from a very simple motivation. I don't like to do household chores and I largely am looking to automate those things. And I realized that it's not easy and this is something to, to be solved. Yeah, I have a very simplistic motivation there, but I guess it's somewhat powerful in that if you like to be lazy, great things will come out of it. I spend, I spend half a day a week at NYU uh, exploring this with another professor called Laurel Pinto and a bunch of students. If you take robotics, you can largely summarize it uh, into the muscles like, and, the, and the bones, like building the hardware and then building the brain and sen some amount of sensors, mostly building the intelligence and you know the brain. And then the third one is communicating with humans. Like, how do you, like, sure, like you're intelligent and you're, you can do things, but can you talk to a human? So there's these three aspects and a lot of progress needs to be made in hardware, robotics, just, as something as fundamental as can you make a robotic hand that is a, the same size as a human hand and have as much dexterity and can lift up as much uh, weight and stuff? We can't. We don't know how to. We literally state of the art today is we don't know how to do this. We can build something that's like 30% larger and is way crappier dexterity and breaks all the time and stuff, right? And so progress needs to be made there. I can't really help with it. I'm not a hardware engineer. I know a lot of smart people are working on it, and that's great. And then there's the brain bar. It's like, how do you reason about the world? How do you look? Whatever. There's some amount of it that I help with, but largely, I think there's a lot of people working on it. I think that's the part where most people in the deep learning slash robotics intersection work on. And then there's the human robotics interaction part. And I don't really mean like HCI, HRI from a academic side of things. I mean it more from a product side of things. It's like when you use the iPhone for the first time, it was so natural that you didn't need to learn it kind of a angle. It's like you need to communicate with a robot in a way that just feels like it's pretty normal. Lot, not a lot of people work on it. Mostly, there's not a lot of incentive in academia, and that's where a lot of the robotics research goes on. And on the on the capital side, on the, on the industry side, there's not enough money yet in robotics, especially home robotics, to work on it. So I try to work a lot more on that side of things. Just how do you teach a robot something quickly? How, like how do you most naturally teach it with a combination of gestures and actions and words I, I i i like it this is this is an interesting area i don't i don't think it's anywhere close to being a reality i'm expecting maybe in seven years like i could automate it just for myself in my home in a way that's not very really generalized and in, in that in in other environments or it's robust enough and maybe that's probably when more capital can be injected at that phase i think it transitions from being a researchy thing that needs to be funded by government grants to being, oh, you can actually put a lot more capital into it and make it a big thing so that people can actually use it at scale. Only time will tell, but I find that very fun. All right. Well, we always end with two questions. And the second to last one is, what is an underrated aspect of machine learning that you think people should pay more attention to or something that you'd like to look into if you had more time? With the amount of uh, with the amount of attention that is given to machine learning these days, <laughs> it's really hard to find a a direction that is underrated. But one thing that I do I do think people should spend a little bit more time into is build systems that kind of merge the 
symbolic expert systems from the 80s to the end-to-end neural network systems that we see today that were popular from the 90s and then in 2000s. There's a bunch of effort that went into those kinds of systems. A lot of people won Turing Awards for those directional systems in the 80s and late 70s. Psych as a project still it exists It does? I can't today. believe Psych still exists? Yeah, yeah. It wow. still exists today. It's like... People find it very important to dunk the other side. They find it their life's mission to be like, no, that's an idiotic side. That is just not useful or whatever. But I I don't know if I fully believe it. If I had a little bit more time and priority, I would explore that side of it. Interesting. More. Very cool. Um, and then the last question is always, what's the biggest challenge of making machine learning work in the real world? And this might be your users, like what's the hardest part about getting a model working and into production doing something useful? Installing CUDA drivers. Oh my God, drivers. still doing something? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. That That is largely better these days. I think people underestimate all the time. People all the time underestimate how little machine learning helps. If you have a problem to be solved, machine learning probably solves the hardest part of the problem, but it's probably a very small part of the overall problem. And people are constantly surprised that AI is not just them just throwing a magic wand and everything seems to just have been solved for them. A large part of AI development, either research or in production, is constructing the loss functions. You construct the loss functions very carefully or else it doesn't work the way you want it to. The loss function or the feedback loop or whatever you call it, right? How does how does it help inform things? I think people perpetually underestimate it to a surprising effect. It's almost like you expect it to get better, but it only gets worse over time. Totally agree. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. This is a lot of fun. Well, thank you so much, Lucas. I just want to say I'm a huge fan of Weights and Biases. I've been using it since 2016, 2017, and I've recommended it to like hundreds of my friends, and I'm pretty honored to be on the That's podcast. That's so nice of you to say. I mean, can I ask just one last question? What do you What do you like about it? I like that it is seamless and it always works and it's stupid proof. It's just like, I know... All I have to do is just put a vanb.log and it, it goes somewhere into the internet. I don't need to think about or run my server and my server broke in the night. Like I don't need to cognitively think about a whole set of machinery in a way that wasn't true before rates and biases, in my opinion. Like there were other software as well, but they broke in somewhere or the other. TensorBoard, okay, you have to go run a local server thing somewhere and then like open it. And practically, like you need tunneling because you, you it's running on your server that you might not have direct access to or whatever. And there's other kinds of products that were like, yeah, this is great. This is seamless, except you have to create an enterprise account for which you have to call our customer service agent and convince us that you're like a user that who will pay us money. There are many ways in which it was frictious and not intuitive. Like others was like the API was clunky and hard to use and stuff. I think you you just solved it in a way that is just seamless and it just seems to work. And it seems like you thought about the problem by the parallel plots and like a few few other ways. You, you did think about the problem well in a way that felt like someone like me who's a machine learning researcher knows I have everything I need from your product. So that's that's my... Do you have any take. feature requests or any suggestions on how to make it better? <laughs> um, my feature request will probably take your company to pay <laughs> <it>. <laughs> But in general, I, I think uh, a lot about, I have had this pet project that I even wrote a proposal for that for myself, because I keep forgetting about my own ideas, which I think is, I think it is achievable, but needs to be extremely careful engineering that we can build a real time 
system that 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 trains but you can adjust almost all aspects of the system through the you it's almost seamless it's like you go from programming uh, you go from code to like the, the symbolic knobs to code in a way that doesn't look clunky i mean there's been attempts that have been made uh that like like streamlit and streamlit like there like like this like oh, we run the program again and again, and like we'll just only update the parts or whatever. But I don't think any of them got it right. I think there is a product to be made, and I would expect if anyone could do it, you, you all could. Amazing. <laughs> we'll have to show you Weave, which we launched a few weeks ago that, that might do this for you. Awesome. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Have a good all right. tip. Yeah. If you're enjoying these interviews and you want to learn more, please click on the link to the show notes in the description where you can find links to all the papers that are mentioned, supplemental material, and a transcription that we work really hard to produce. So check it out.